All right, well, welcome. We're going to continue on in our series today, the book of Hosea. And if you don't have a copy of God's Word, you can grab one in the back. We've got Bibles for you. You can pull it up on your device. But I'm going to ask for a little crowd participation as we get started today. This has never happened to me in my entire life. Does anybody see a little burgundy Bible in your row? Is that it? <laughs> if, there was any, if there was any doubt, thank you. Like, I put it somewhere. I know it's in the room. So I was going through a few people's Bibles in the back that looked similar, so forgive me for that. So if there was any doubt that your pastor's not perfect, uh, there, I just confirmed that. But thank you. So we're in, the, we're in the book of Hosea. I don't know who your people are. It's a new term going around, your tribe. It's your tribe, the people you hang with. Who are your peeps? So the first group of people that come to my mind are the dog park people because we spend a lot of time, my wife and I, at the dog park. Almost every day we're there around 5 a.m. And they're, they're our people, right? We know them and they know us. They share details of their life all because we each have a four-legged pet run around the, the dog park. And so if somebody isn't there, they're like, hey, where's Joe today? You know, what happened to Joe? And everybody's texting each other where, where people are. But who are your people? Who's your tribe? Who are the people that you, you hang with, your, your people? We are looking at Hosea chapter 2. This is the third week of the series on Hosea. And it's a little book. I've had some conversations the last few weeks of People saying, I didn't know this was in there. Uh, boy, there's a lot here I didn't know. And we, we talked about uh, to make sure we spend some time getting to know some of these books we might be unfamiliar with. Because, right, Christian, there's going to be a day you might be in heaven and someone comes up to you and you meet them for the very, very first time, Obadiah. You're like, I don't think I've, we've ever met. No, we've never met, but did you read my book? <laughs> right? And you want to be able to say, I read your book, right? Because they're going to ask you, did you read my book? So Hosea might be, might be one of those, those people. Hosea is a prophet. And just a, a recap, sum up the last few weeks. Uh, a prophet had three primary roles. One was to proclaim, to speak truth. The other was to predict. And then the third one was to display his life. Right? There was, based on how he lived his life, there was a message God wanted to communicate to him him or her, and they would live out that message in the course of their life. And they were asked to do some difficult things. Hosea probably is the prophet I'd want to be the least based upon what God asked of him. And so we ended, the last time we were in Hosea, we ended with this family postcard, the Christmas card of the family. You had Hosea. Remember, they're living in a a glass house. They're this is public. Everybody knows what's happening in this family. He was close to the king, and everybody sees what's happening. He's got an unfaithful wife. Her name is Gomer, and he's got three beautiful children named Judgment, No Mercy, and Not My People. And so that's the picture of the postcard that you have. That's where we left off. And now we come to, to chapter 2. And this is a whole illustration God is trying to communicate to the nation of Israel. This is an Old Testament book, right? We're reading this in the context of the gospel through the person of Jesus. So we look back to the Old Testament. God, this is what God is trying to communicate his love for the nation of Israel. How is he going to communicate this? He takes, he asks Hosea, I want you to be the faithful husband. And Gomer is going to play the adulterous woman as Israel is being the adulteress with other idols and nations. So that's, that's where we find ourselves today. Chapter 2, verse 1. Say to your brothers, you are my people, and to your sisters, you have received mercy. Plead with your mother, plead, for this is not my wife, and I am not her husband, that she put away her whoring from her face and her adultery from between her breasts, lest I strip her naked and make her in the day she was born. And make her like a wilderness, and make her like a parched land, 
and kill her with thirst. Upon her children also I will have no mercy, because they are children of whoredom. What is God saying to the nation of Israel? You have forsaken me. God's heart, as is Hosea, is hurt for his wife. God's heart is broken over his people. These are his people, the nation of Israel, as they wander and as they worship other idols and other other gods. What's happening in the northern kingdom of Israel right now is very prosperous. The economy is doing really well. It's booming. Everything's going really, really well, except in the area of morality and spirituality. They've taken the good that God has given to them, and they've used that to worship to worship other idols. We continue, we continue on uh, verse, jump down to verse 6. Therefore I will hedge up her way with thorns, I will build a wall against her that she cannot find her path. She, she shall pursue her lovers, but not overdo them. And she shall seek them, but shall not find them. Then she shall say, I will go and return to my first husband, for it was better for me than now. And she did not know that it was I who gave her the grain and the wine and the oil and who lavished on her silver and gold, which they use for Baal. Or Baal. Therefore, I will take back my grain in its time and my wine in its season. I will take away my wool and my flax, which were to cover her nakedness. What's, what's happening here? It's as if Hosea, he's the faithful husband, and he is still buying and providing for his unfaithful wife. As she is not coming home at night, as she is with other men, who is still providing for her? Hosea. Hosea's role has not changed as the faithful husband. And this passage in chapter 2 says he is still doing the grocery shopping, right? He's a single parent. He's raising these children. He's raising judgment and no mercy, not my people. He's the single dad. Now he's going grocery shopping. Not just for him, but he's bringing it to the door of where she is with an unfaithful in her, in her unfaithfulness. And she's saying, hey, I have, I have wine, I have wool, and I have flax, and I have seeds, and I have water, and I have all this stuff. Not even recognizing that it's being provided by her husband, who she is breaking his heart on a, on a daily basis. And before we are quick to point the fingers that not what we all have done at some point. God has been so good to us. He shows us even when we're chasing after other things, God still provides. Even after, even as I run after idols, and there might be an area of, in our life that we're taking something good that God has given to us and we are twisting it and we're using it to build our own kingdom. I'm using it to make myself look good. I'm using it for my own glory. We've taken what God has given to us. That's what, that's what she's doing. Hosea continues to be the faithful husband, continues to provide for her. Even the jewelry that she is wearing, the silver and the gold, is being provided to her by her husband. By her husband. He's the groceries at the door where she is staying. Now, Try to imagine the, the gossip and the mockery and are you still, why are you still with her? Because this is what God has asked of Hosea. Because this is how I am with my people. My people do not recognize me. They do not thank me. They're not grateful f- for what I have given to them. But I'm still going to provide for them. Verse, verse 14 Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. And there I will give her vineyards and make the valley of Achor. A valley of Achor is similar to valley of Achan. Achan was another character in the Bible. Uh, it represents death and sin. And God is saying, no matter how bad it gets, no matter how far we have ran away, no matter what we have run to, there is hope. No matter what has happened in your life, no matter what you have done, no matter what has been done to you, the story of the Bible is there is hope. There is no one in this room beyond hope today. There is hope. 
There's the door of hope, and there shall be and there she shall answer as in the days of her youth, as in the times when she came up out of the land of Egypt. As I was looking through this passage and studying over it this week, something that came to my mind is this idea of, of shame. And we're going to look more at that in a little bit. But we've all done things in our life, if we're honest, right? I'm going to encourage you to be honest. Be honest with yourself, be honest with God, and respond accordingly today. There's all been th- things that we've all done that we have some regret over, decisions that we've made in our life. I want to talk to you about the difference between self-confidence and self-worth. I think Hosea and Gomer wrestled through both of these things. What's self-confidence? Self-confidence, where do you find self-confidence fun- from? Self-confidence is found in successes that you have had in your life. When, when you do something good, it gives you self-confidence that maybe tomorrow I'll do something better and it gives me confidence I'm going to get this job. It gives me confidence in the next free throw I take, I'm just going to go in. Why? Because the last free throw went in, right? When a shooter's in a slump, they just need to see that ball go in the hoop and then they get more self-confidence, right? That's self-confidence. The, when you go to the plate, if you're 0 for 10, you don't have very much self-confidence that you're at bat number 11, you're going to get a hit. You tracking with me? That's self-confidence. Self-worth is some, something completely different. Self-worth is given to you by your creator. It does not rise and fall. Self-confidence goes up and down. But self-worth never changes. Self-worth is infinite. Self-worth comes from, comes from God. You're valuable, not based on what you've done or what you haven't done. Not based on your degrees, not based on your successes or your failures or how good you look. Your self-worth comes from who made you and God created you. And you have, whether you feel like it or not, you have infinite worth because a holy God sees you, created you, and because of that, he, he loves you. Parents in the room, you can relate to This idea of conditional and unconditional love. We all love our our kids. I used to ask my girls, do you know why dad, why mom and dad love you? And you might, well, you know, after a while they picked up on it. Yeah, dad, and they roll their eyes. Yeah, we know. Because you're mine is why I love you. But sometimes it's easy to say, well, I'm really proud of you after they hit a home run or after they score a 10 at the gymnastics meet, right? It, or we look at that report card and it's 4.0. Oh, we, we're proud of you and we love you. That's conditional love. But ultimately, we love our kids unconditionally because they're ours. And that's the same with uh, mighty God, all-powerful God who created you. There's nothing you can do to get God to love you more or less. He loves you as you are today. You do not have to work harder. You don't have to strive for more or do better. His love for you is unconditional. And that, my friends, never wavers. Your self-worth does not waver. It does not go up and down based on how the day was. And what an encouragement for all of us. Whether we got the job or we got our 15th rejection letter, your worth is not found in what other people have to say about you. Your worth is found in who made you. And that is God. I don't know who needs to hear that today. But God sees you and he loves you unconditionally. There's nothing you can do. And why is this important in this story? Because Gomer is doing everything she can to run away from her husband. And Hosea is constantly being rejected. And we would look at this and say, why are they still together? And just as a reminder... This is not a text for marriage. If you're having marriage struggles, this is not the text that you would go to and get marriage advice from, right? Now, now there's some principles in here that I think are, are helpful. This is the message for us of God telling his people, how much, how can I convey to this group of people that I love them? What picture, how can I demonstrate now, this is before Christ. This is, this is a before the cross. And then he says, Behold, 
In verse, verse 14 that we read, I will allure her. This word, Spurgeon says about this word allure, this is a singular kind of power. I will allure her. It's not I will force her. I will drag her. I, I will draw her. No, I will allure her. It's a remarkable word. And then I will allure her with my lavishness. I will pour out upon her my lavishness of love and goodness. It's not based on what she has done. But this is how the devil ruins it. He tempts us with honeyed words, sweet utterances, with baits of pleasure and the like. And the Lord in mercy determines that in all truth he will outbid the devil. And he will win us to himself by fascinations, enticements, and allurements which shall be stronger than any force of resistance, of resistance that this world has to offer. There is, every day you wake up, this world is trying to entice you and pull you away from what you know to be true and what God has said about you. There are many things that will pull you and cause us all to be unfaithful in our relationship with God. But that does not change who God is and his desire for uh, to have a relationship with us. And what's happening in the relationship between Hosea and Gomer is there is broken peace. Anyone in the room who's been married, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The peace has been broken. The relationship is not at its best right now. And when you experience broken peace, you cannot receive peace from someone until you have peace with someone, and that is true in our relationship with God. Sometimes we pray, right? we pray for peace throughout the day. But if I don't have peace in the relationship, I'm going to have a hard time receiving peace from that relationship. And you know, for those of you in a relationship, before things are going to get really good, you got to restore that relationship has to be restored. There has to be peace in that relationship and the same is true in a relationship with God. There's some of us in the room today who maybe have never made peace with God. What does that look like? Paul talks about in Romans chapter 5. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And if that's you today, I just want you to think about that one verse. Nothing else today. While you were a sinner, while I was a sinner, it wasn't after I got clean after I said goodbye to all the idols of my life and I come back to God, then Jesus died for me. While I was in my sin, Christ died for me. That's a picture. What's happening here in Hosea is a picture pointing ultimately to Jesus. Chapter 3. I know we're covering a lot of text today. My prayer is that maybe it spurs you on to dive deeper into this text throughout this week. But Hosea chapter 3. And the Lord said to me, right? The first time we heard that was chapter 1, verse 1. Hosea just graduates from prophet school. And God said, okay, I've got my first word for you. This is, this is the next assignment. Hosea is like, please make this one a little bit easier than that first one. I've, I did what you asked the first time. Okay, so the next assignment. The Lord said to me, go again. Love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods. And listen, look at this. If you've got a pen or pencil, you can highlight that or circle it or highlight it in your device. And love, love cakes of raisins or raisin cakes. You're like, what in the world does that have to do? I know God has a lot of things he can accuse us of, pride and immorality, and there's a long list, the top ten and everything, but... Really? That's what God's going to call us out on is eating raisin cakes? Yes. What's the significance of that? Throughout the Old Testament, you see it's not just cake made with raisins. It's actually the batter is made with dried grapes that are rubbed together and creates this cake that's made of raisins. It's not cake with raisins. I don't know if I'm confusing you all in this room. But what, what it was given to the people were to use that as in the altar process to sacrifice to God, to use that in the celebrations, recognizing God's goodness and provision in our life. This was, was given to them throughout Scripture, throughout the Old Testament. You're to use this. It's really good, too, by the way. You can, you can eat it, but you use it in your festivals and your sacrifices to God. So what was happening? She was taking, taking what God had given to them, and rather giving it back, taking it and giving it to another. 
And how many times have we done that? We've taken God's provision and we've used it for our own glory rather than using it for what he has given it to us for. Abigail uses um, this as gift to David. There's this, this idea of cakes of raisins, but I don't know what raisin cake in your life represents an idol. I don't know what God has given to you that right now the Holy Spirit's convicting you that you have not been using it for good. You've been chasing after something else or someone else that is trying to win your heart away from, from your faithful husband, from the perfect husband. And ultimately, we see that Jesus becomes, Jesus is the better Hosea. Hosea is a type of Christ pointing to Jesus who ultimately becomes our perfect husband, our perfect husband. Verse 2, so I bought her. All right, so what does Hosea do? He does what God asked him to do. And I can't imagine the, how he wrestled through this and, and maybe argued with God on this. We, we're not told all of that. One day we can ask him about that and we can, we can talk to the author of this book. But So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lethbeck of barley. So back when I was Bible school, I remember uh, a gomer for a homer is how I remember this passage. But uh, a homer, barley is 15 shekels of silver of barley. So that adds up to be 30 shekels of silver. Say that fast, right? Uh, In Exodus says, how much does it cost to buy a slave back? 30 shekels of silver. She's not just in prostitution at this point. She's being sold. She's in slavery. One of the organizations we support as a church is an organization called Harvest India. A number of years ago, I had an opportunity to go and walk through some of the red light districts with some of the missionaries who were on the ground there and had a chance to pray and meet some of the women who are caught in this awful evil of human trafficking. It is a very real problem in our day and age today, not just in India, but all over the world. And the question I had is, hey, could Harvest India just simply buy these women out of slavery and set them free? And and the answer is they could, but they would return because of the power and the influence of of the owners. It wouldn't be enough to, to just buy them back. They would return to this. And so we see what Hosea does here. I don't know if he had to call somebody up to watch the kids while he goes down to the downtown marketplace. And up on a stage are are those who are being sold. And Gomer's among them. And there's a good chance she was stripped naked and she's standing up there. And the bidding begins. And Hosea, who is her husband begins to outbid every other man there. And there's no price he's not willing to pay to get her wife back, to get his wife back. And he probably, when sold, sold to the man in the back. It's Hosea. He probably takes some cloth or a cloak, his own coat, and he wraps it over her and he brings her home. It's about a half a year's salary is what he paid to have her back. This is his wife, to buy her back. Now, I have a limited bank account. Maybe you do too. But the God we serve does not have a limit. There's no amount of money he's not willing to pay to buy you back. A great expense, great cost. Why? To restore the relationship. When this was originally written, God's talking about him, his relationship with the nation of Israel. And there's prophecy, there's some prophecy that has not happened yet that Hosea is talking about. But now, in light of what we know about Jesus, we read the text in Hosea through the filter of Jesus, who comes and says, I am the bridegroom to the church. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are part of the big C church. You are part of the bride of Christ. 
And the bride is beautiful, not because of what she has done or hasn't done, but because of the one who bought the bride. Paul picks up on that passage in Ephesians 5, 22 through 33, where he tells the husband to love his wife five, six times. And my friends, the wife is never told to love her husband anywhere in Scripture. You, you can do some homework this week. And you, you, now, wives, easy on the conversation on the way home to, from church, right? See, I told you I don't have to love you. But what is happening here? What is happening? There's a, there's a few things happening. If the husband loves the wife like Christ loves the church, the wife will never need to be told to love her husband. That will be her response. Her automatic response will be one of gratefulness and, and thank you and respect and will love him back. And all of us in this room at one point or another in our life have not felt worth being bought back. We've all been at a point, based on our decisions and our actions in our life, we feel like, no, I'm not worth that. Nobody's going to buy me back. Why would they want me? We've all thought that if we're honest. And God says, no, I'm going to about outbid everything this world has to offer you. I'm going to outbid because I love you and I want to have a relationship with you. Jesus is the bridegroom. Jesus is the perfect husband who will never leave you. It doesn't matter how many times you run away and you chase after everything under the sun. Jesus says, I am here. I will be the last man standing to buy you back. That is good news. And that is the gospel found in the book of Hosea. And he buys her back. He outbids. And then he says to her, you must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore belong to another man, so I will be also to you. For the children of Israel shall dwell many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or pillar. He's talking about the exile that's about to happen in a couple of months from the time he's writing this. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God. This is future tense. And David their king, and they shall come in fear of the Lord and to his goodness in the latter days. God says, I'm trying to communicate to you how much I love you, and I love you. I care about you so much that I know the damage and the hurt that happens to you when you chase after all these other things. They will please you for a night, but they will not last. I, God says, am the only one who will, who will fulfill you and remind you of your self-worth. It is not based on what you've done or you haven't done. That's not why Hosea went to buy Gomer back because she was this great wife. It's the opposite. But he was trying to communicate to her how much he loved her. I don't know the full story of Gomer. We're going to continue on in this, the rest of this passage and the rest of the book of Hosea. There's a lot here. But we don't know all the, the full story of, of her heart. One day we might get to know that. But peace was made. When he bought her back, there was peace. There was a reconciliation that happened between Gomer and Hosea that then allowed her, and again, we don't know all the details here, as she wakes up every morning going forward, we don't know the full story, but I can imagine would give her purpose and a reminder of her worth. It's a powerful thing. When you can get up in the morning knowing no matter what happens today, it does not change my worth, does not change my identity, does not change my creator, that he loves me and cares about me. And he, my friends, desires to have an eternal relationship with you, not just this world, for eternity. There's nothing God could ever do for you or give to you greater than the gift of himself. In the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 40 we're told how much God loves us. It says, God would give nations in exchange for you. For you. Do you know how much God loves you today? It's beyond anything I can say. It's beyond any words that I have for you. God says, hey, I don't have the words. Let me show you a picture. 
It's a man who's going to buy his unfaithful wife back. Jesus today, for anyone who has not placed their faith and trust in him, Jesus says, ask, seek, and knock. The Greek verbs could be translated as keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. Why? Because Christ doesn't just, he's not just interested in a one-time conversation with you. He's looking for an ongoing relationship and conversation that has no end. That every day, He's there. Every day, he's, he's faithful. Every day, he's bringing groceries at your door. No matter what we're chasing after, he still is good to us. Do we recognize the good gifts we have? And are there any raisin cakes that we're chasing after that we need to confess and admit today and say, I've been chasing after these idols? How do we know that God loves us? Another way that we know that God loves us is he disciplines us. He disciplines us. It says God in Hebrews, God disciplines those whom he loves. If there's an area of our life that we need to return back to him, we might find discipline in that. I've shared the story, for those of you who've been attending Boulder for a number of months, I've shared the story of my siblings. There's six siblings, there's seven of us kids, and the restored relationship that God has done among all of us. It's a beautiful thing, it's a sweet thing. And every first Saturday of every month, we get on a Zoom call with my dad, and, and we just have a, we have a great, great conversation. We're enjoying peace with each other after many years of broken relationships. But one of the stories I'd like to share with you this morning involves my youngest sister. My youngest brother and sister were foster children who eventually never left our house. My parents loved having infant babies come in and and out. Many of them left, but two never left, and they ended up being my brother and my sister, and uh, I love them. My youngest sister, when she was in late elementary school, uh, our mom died, and so her biological mom chose not to keep her, and now her adoptive mom has passed away. And she's the youngest growing up with us. My dad at the time was in his 60s raising two little kids. He's like, I didn't sign up for this. But she ends up getting into some trouble in junior high and drops out of school in high school. And and my dad calls me up. My dad at the time, um, he was, we were attending the same church. I was the youth pastor to my brother and my sister. My dad calls me. He's like, Son, I need to talk to you, but I'm not going to show up as your, as your dad. I'm going to show up as a parent of a child in your youth group. And so he says, what do I do? What do I do with Rebecca? And he was crying. He's like, I, I know what I need to do, but it's so hard to do it. And he had to send her away. We, we recommended, my siblings and I recommended that we had to intervene. We had to get her help. And Some of you have lived this out, or you're living it out right now with with adult children, adult prodigals, possibly. And so she was too volatile to fly to the rehab center in South Carolina. We were living in Kansas at the time. And so this organization sent two escorts to pick her up in the middle of the night, and she wasn't allowed to take anything. And they, they came into her bedroom, and I remember my dad just weeping, in the middle of the night, and she's holding on to her bedpost saying, Dad, don't, don't, make him, don't make him take me. I don't want to go. My dad knew that was the right decision. It was a hard decision. Any parent in the room can relate. You love your kids. You make hard decisions, hard boundaries you got to make on your kids sometimes. Why? Because you love them. God is the same way. He loves us. And Sometimes it feels like, boy, life is really, really hard right now. God is is lovingly disciplining us because he doesn't want us to continue down this path. Long story short, she goes, and it was difficult, and oh, she hated us. She hated Dad. But over the time, over years, she comes back, and she gets her GED, and she goes and gets her undergrad. She goes and gets her master's. She gets, goes to law school. She becomes a lawyer. She's practicing law outside of Dallas right now, and we all call her up when we need advice. (laughs) But I share that with you because there's a God who is, right, human terms here, shedding tears over some of us in the room. 
desiring to bring us back, return back. When you read this passage in Hosea, when she says, I'm going to return to my, my husband, you get the story of, of Luke 15 of the prodigal. There's a little bit of a story of the prodigal son where he realizes and wakes up one day, oh, I'm going to go back home. Because sin was, it felt good for a moment, for a night, but I'm going to go back home. And, and Gomer has the same realization. I'm going to go back home to my husband. So today, there may be some of us in the room who confess that there's an idol. There's been some raisin cakes we've been chasing after. We've been using the good things that God has given us for our own benefit, for our own pleasure, for our own glory. And I would just say, confess that today. Be honest with God. Return back to him. Another word for return is repent. Repent. Return back to him. If you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus, who is standing bidding right now for you, and he's outbidding the devil, he's outbidding everything else that this world can throw at you, return to him. Say yes to him. He's our, he's our husband. And by us, I, he's the church's husband, the bride of Christ. And listen, the church is messed up. I know that because I'm, I'm part of it. The church is broken. The church is, has some bad history in the hundreds of centuries of, right? The church has made some mistakes and missteps over the years. But the church is the greatest mission that the world has ever seen and will ever see. Why? Because of the perfect husband that the church has. The bride of Christ marches forward because of the worth that the bridegroom has given to the bride of Christ, the church. For anyone who's placed their faith and trust in Jesus, you're part of the church, the church big C. Not just talking Boulder Mountain, you're part of the church. It's the greatest family to ever be a part of. I'm going to pray, and uh, as I pray and as we close our time together, I just ask that you'd be honest with God. If there's something to confess, I'm going to ask any prayer team members in the room to come forward, and we'll be down front to, to offer to pray. You would, you would confess, you would give your life to Jesus, if that's where you're at. In the back, I've got some cards that look like this. For any parent in the room who's praying for a prodigal, there's some prayer prompts. Just give me some direction. How do we pray for our adult children or maybe grandchildren or, or other individuals you know who have, they're running after someone else? Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for this text in Hosea that gives us just an incredible, beautiful picture of your unconditional love for us. God, I pray that you would remind us that our self-worth does not come from what other people have to say about me. It does not come from what the highs and lows of the week. It comes from you, and that will never, ever change. Father, I pray that for the person in the room who's never placed their faith and trust in you, and they're going to say today, I'm banking everything on Jesus today. The one who will never leave me, the one who will never forsake me, never forget about me, never say, okay, you've reached a limit, that's enough but the one, rather, who continues to show up at our door to provide for us, even as we run after other things. I pray that confession in this room would happen as, Holy Spirit, you remind us of the things in our life, of those idols that we have chased after, that we would just say, hey, we want you more than anything else. Move in this place, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. I want to take a moment to say thank you for joining us for today's service online. I'm going to invite you to our website where there are a number of different action steps to take following today's service. Maybe joining a small group or finding a place to serve, or sending a prayer request into the church to let us know how we can help you and how we can be praying for you. If you found this message today encouraging and supportive, I'm going to ask you to like or share or comment. And let us know and, and share that with your friends. If it's been an encouragement to you, I trust you'll be an encouragement to others as you share this resource. Hey, we've been praying for you. We're going to continue to pray for you throughout this week and trust you'll join us again next weekend. Have a great week.